We're going to reconvene our last panel of the day. Um, and I, sh I would just say that as a museum, it's, it's um, such a rare, wonderful thing to be able to um, bring together so many different voices. Um, on the subject and so many different experts um, in the field um, bringing together experts on law, culture, and politics. And so our last panel will be focusing on politics. Um, and so we have here Andrea Shorter, former Director of Marriage and Coalitions at Equality California. And at EQCA, um, Andrea guided key initiatives towards restoring civil marriage rights for same-sex couples in California's communities of color and faith. Andrea's commitment to achieving equality for LGBT people through coalition building has been a constant in her professional life. Prior to assuming her directorial roles at EQCA, she was the director of And Marriage for All, a public education campaign to engage African Americans in the dialogue about same-sex marriage equality. She is also in her fourth term, uh, or was in her fourth term as president of the, or currently is, you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, <laughs> uh, in her fourth term as president of the Commission on the Status of, of Women for the City and County of San Francisco, which has become an international model for advancing gender equity. On her um, right, your left, um, is Thomas Watson, co-founder of Love, Honor, Cherish. Watson co-founded Love, Honor, Cherish, a nonprofit civil rights organization dedicated to supporting the right to marry in California. Love, Honor, Cherish organized against Prop 8 and since Prop 8's passage has been the leading advocate for the repeal of Prop 8 at the ballot box. Tom is a longtime community organizer. His work has included organizing colleges to oppose the ROTC's ban on gay students during the early 1990s, lobbying for the Employment of Non-Discrimination Act in the mid-1990s, and fighting Proposition 22. Tom is currently advising Mark Takano, the Democratic candidate for Congress in Riverside, California, who is working to be the first openly gay person of color ever elected to Congress. Tom is a graduate of Harvard College and Georgetown Law School and a partner in the law firm McCool Smith Hennigan PC in Los Angeles. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you, um, and really thank you, Apsara, and all the folks here at the museum um, for putting on a really, I think, interesting and extraordinary exhibit that um, I'm looking forward to looking back at the book in a year and two years and 10 years and reflecting on what this moment um, means in terms of in terms of marriage equality. Um, the discussion today and the exhibit prompted me to think about uh, what the formative events were in my life that led me to activism and led me to a very particular, uh, I think, focus uh, and approach to activism and to persuading people to support LGBT rights. And the first one, um, appropriately enough is really one that Cleve Jones is responsible for. Um, I am from Indiana and came out my freshman year of college and the first month that I was out I found myself in, Ma in Washington DC for the 1987 March on Washington and the searing memory of that for me aside from realizing that there were more gay people than the one person whom I'd known in Indiana and more like a million uh, other gay people was the AIDS quilt set on the mall in the middle of the, the classical you know, Greco-Roman architecture that frames our democracy and our republic, and doing, um, doing so in the most American of ways, a, a quilt. And so as opposed to the protest signs or the t-shirts, um, like what I remember from the time was cruise men, not missiles, just you know, a delightful slogan. Um, the quilt was approachable, uh, American, uh, democratic, uh, touching, emotional, and there were panels that I recall touched me because there were individuals that I had something in common with. And, and that was as the kid from Indiana. And that, I think, was you know, an important lesson in framing our efforts at achieving equality. The second one, a little bit different type of art, 
which is Robert Maplethorpe, someone we haven't you know, kind of touched upon today in our history, but the Jesse Helms battle for the NEA and a, a opposition to Robert Maplethorpe and his art was also, I think, a formative, uh, a formative event in our, our history. And for me, uh, and I think when you look back at Maplethorpe's art, uh, it is extraordinarily in your face and sexual and uh, shocking in many respects. And, and it's something that, in some sense, I think we've evolved uh, if you look at the, the air we breathe because there isn't this intense need to have this in-your-face sexuality as opposed to, I think, uh, we're, we're more whole, well-rounded individuals uh, and perhaps more complete, full individuals in the, the exhibit or in some of the representations in the exhibit today. But the Maplethorpe exhibit taught me at least the lesson of you need to be direct and upfront and clear. And at that time I was in college and what we spent uh, our time doing, uh, some friends of mine and I, we formed an organization that went around campus posting um, artwork, some Maplethorpe, some from ACT UP, some uh, that we had taken ourselves, of uh, same-sex couples in intimate positions, uh, kissing, uh, some sexualized imagery, and the idea was that we were all scared of being out and scared of the violence that accompanied being out at that time, and we would rather have people become desensitized um, and rip down the poster as opposed to rip us up. But the lesson of that was that by being direct and clear, we did, uh, I think, achieve a desensitization and achieve some of our goals. So those two experiences kind of framed, um, I think, my approach to, um, to activism, and it's, it's one I think Cleve kind of hit upon too, is you need to be brash and bold, but you also need to be uh, Americana. You need to be uh, in touch with the things that people care about, the emotions, the feelings. The third experience that I wanted to just touch upon, and Jenny brought this up, was the Hawaii same-sex marriage trial. Um, I had the pleasure of attending part of it and sitting in a courtroom, uh, and at that time I was in law school, or um, sitting in a courtroom watching people testify under oath, sworn in, in their suits, uh, although some people, it was Hawaii, some people were in Hawaiian shirts, but um, the experts for the other side were in their suits saying how, uh, in a very clinical way, no gay people were capable of being good parents. And the state had this compelling interest in preventing same-sex marriage due to what horrible people we were, or at least how horrible we would be as parents. And um, that was so shocking. And um, uh, at some point, the expert did admit that he didn't believe in evolution, uh, which also seemed shocking, although I guess it qualifies him to run for president today. Um, we, we uh, as a gay community, I think, realized what our enemies have to say about us and that we needed to really confront them and move ahead. And so those are kind of some formative experiences that have shaped my approach to doing today marriage activism. It's actually something I've been doing now, shockingly enough, for I think 20 years. Uh, it was the first time I really started speaking out to the right to marry. And from my perspective, it was, I simply, uh, from uh, I think a religious background, viewed myself created in God's image, and God uh, made me gay, and why should I be anything less than anyone else? Um, and so I think kind of with that, that's a bit of my background, um, and I'll turn it over to Andrea to talk about hers. Sure, sure. Well, I feel like I need to out myself in a couple of ways today, uh, just for full disclosure. I don't know what it is, but it happens that we know, both of us know, we happen both to be Hoosiers. So, <laughs> but yeah, and then Cleve, and I'm looking over at Cleve, and I'm like, what is going on? There's this <laughs> congregation of, of, of uh, Hoosiers now in San Francisco and uh, in California that are, that are um, involved in, in, uh, in the forefront of this, this battle. So I, I, I feel better always sitting next to my fellow Hoosiers. Um, you are a Pacers fan, right? Are you, we talked about that. You're more a Colts fan than a pa Pacers fan. Okay, we'll work on that. Um, but also, I, I had the honor and the, and the distinct privilege um, about a decade ago, nearly a decade ago, of actually working with, with Cleve Jones 
uh, my friend, my you, my family, um, with, on the AIDS Memorial Quilt um, expansion, really expanding the use of the quilt um, beyond the United States, certainly a number of chapters throughout the world, but we have actually traveled together to South Africa at the invitation of um, some activists there who had some connections with um, um, Bishop Tutu and others and said, please come over and, and work with us um, before World AIDS Day, I think it was World AIDS Day, and um, to work with them. And I actually don't, don't reference that just, just because, you know, Cleve is in the room and, and I wanna want to um, claim his Hoosiership along with mine and, and our connection to the quilt and, and other things that we've been involved together uh, over the years. But I actually was, was sort of just thinking back to that experience of, of, uh, of the quilt um, and what it really meant to me 10 or so years before coming to San Francisco. Today actually marks my 20th anniversary of having arrived in San Francisco with the full-fledged intent of becoming a troublemaker. Uh, so prior to coming to San Francisco, I had graduated, in fact, from the, here's more symmetry, from a Quaker-based college in Southern California. I won't name names. I'm very proud of my college, but you'll guess, but it graduated uh, the Richard Nixon. So I went to Whittier College. And soon after that, worked for the assembly legislature, and, and so had a very more formal involvement in um, uh, the political scene, so to speak. Um, but eventually found my way to San Francisco with the interest of becoming engaged in more of a grassroots, uh, more of the LGBT, uh, really still even then calling it the, the gay liberation uh, movement. I grew up in Riverside County, um, although uh, having come from, from Indiana, but the, the much of my, uh, my teen years were in in Riverside County. I grew up out in the middle of nowhere, um, basically in a rural part of the state, and which is no longer the middle of nowhere, but, but nonetheless, I don't think that there are any more than five, 6,000 people in the town that I grew up in. I know what it feels like to be isolated. Uh, I know what it feels like to not know that there are other people like you. Um, and I did come out during my college years doing, I was a silence equals death kid. I'm that. I'm that product. Um, it spoke to me and said, if I don't come out, there are some dire consequences here. This is the time. So I'm of that particular generation, and certainly as I witness the, the movement of the AIDS Memorial Quilt and other um, very compelling, very compelling uh, movements and conversations and rallying calls and clarion calls, you, at least in my particular case, you just simply just could not ignore the calling to be a part of that. So that's how I uh, sort of came on onto the scene and then made it up to San Francisco with the intent of actually moving to Berkeley. Um, and so whenever my brother is um, annoyed by me, he says, um, aren't you on your way to Berkeley? Um, but this involvement in the marriage um, battle is something actually of, of some surprise to me. I sort of relate to it, <laughs> what Jenny was sharing a little bit earlier as a, as a lesbian feminist and maybe having had some, um, at one point, more strident and, and ardent opinions about the institution of marriage and so on and so forth. Um, it's of some surprise that I'm, I, I think my friends see that I'm involved. But I think that, that there are two things, and maybe this will help us segue into some of our, our larger discussion, that that really draw me and keep me involved. Uh, one is that to me, the, the politics of the battle um, around marriage equality and what it, what it really means 
is one, about this issue of religion that we talked about earlier, that we cannot deny, um, and wanting to be a part of the effort to really combat, or maybe combat is not the right word, but to be more effective in addressing the real seriousness of the religious right. Now, we've heard various historical um, accounts and references um, around pushing back against the, the religious right, but I think that now more so than, than ever, as a movement, we have to be m better at it. For one of the reasons, as we look, not to get too far ahead of ourselves, uh, or too far ahead of myself, but when we look at sort of the international scope of things that are happening, there's a connection between the movement to kill gays in Uganda <laughs> and what happens here in North America. It's related. It's not happenstance, it's not by chance that, that that's happening. There's a linkage. And I think that as a progressive movement, we have a greater responsibility to take more seriously how to, again, uh, push back, resist, and have a political plan, basically, to address this issue of religion. Um, but I'm gonna stop there, and because I, th I think that we're, we'll have a little more conversation, but um, I just wanted to point that out in terms of, I think, for me at least, that is one of the foremost reasons. I am not interested in living in a society that was promised to me, that still aspires to be what it can be, as a democracy that allows a, an erosion of the separation of church and state over an issue such as marriage equality. And there, there are some, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, I'm sure as we go in, how there's that pivot there. There's more going on, I think, around this issue of marriage equality that the opponents are playing at than maybe we've not been so quick to, to recognize. And there's a reason why they have been effective um, in their framework and their messaging around the dangers <laughs> Um, of, of two people of the same sex engaged in a civil marriage, although they're, they're very careful to not clarify the issue of, of civil marriage, just marriage. But I think that there's, there's something to be, be um, said in terms of politically how we move forward and why that's important for us to grab hold of. I think when um, Andrea and I were talking about the art exhibit and talking about our uh, where we intersect in terms of our approach to marriage equality, the word that, or the words that Andrea suggested were higher truth. That we need to constantly evaluate what we're saying against, I think, that standard. Does it meet the higher truth standard? And in, in conjunction with the, the Prop 8 campaign, which I think really is this watershed you know, era in uh, the LGBT movement, like you to harken back, we ran a whole series of commercials that in hindsight um, were problematic, um, and at the time were problematic, um, but they were what uh, very smart, very uh, thoughtful people um, agreed were the messages we needed to send out. And one um, that comes to mind, and, and hopefully you'll remember seeing this, was, um, was two women standing looking at a photo album and one woman uh, said, oh, that's my cousin and her partner when they got married, and it, it was talking about two women, um, and the one woman says, honestly, I don't know how I feel about the same-sex marriage thing. And the other woman says, no, it's okay. And then, then she says, um, but are you willing to eliminate rights and have our laws treat people differently? And the woman says, no, of course not. So it was, the effort of that commercial was to endeavor to have somebody who felt awkward about it and who, who really the, the look on her face uh, 
seeing the photo of the two women getting married was one of uh, disgust, but also try and appeal to this higher value. The problem with that ad is that um, the reality is I don't think that's um, the message we want to be sending, and it's not long-term an effective message. It is not okay to feel disgust seeing two women get married. And it also, it, it is a contradictory opinion that people are unlikely uh, to act on uh, properly as we had hoped they would in the ballot box. Uh, I, I use the example, if um, you're somebody who doesn't uh, like smoking and thinks smoking is disgusting, you are likely to vote to ban smoking. That is the way um, people work and that's how we exercise our right to vote. The next commercial uh, that you may recall is the superintendent of schools saying um, uh, that our schools are not required to teach anything, uh, or I'm sorry, the Prop 8 doesn't require our schools to teach marriage, and in fact, uh, says the, the statement in the commercial was, Prop 8 has nothing to do with schools or kids. This is something that doesn't meet, I think, my higher truth test. Prop 8 is all about kids. And of course, we want kids in schools to learn about same-sex marriage. Why would we say something that is not a true statement? Kids are the most impacted by whether or not their parents are married. That is one of the critical reasons we want marriage. And so we ran a campaign um, that did not always aspire to these higher truths. And I think that kind of leads to uh, much of my background and why the organization that I, I co-founded and I'm involved with is called Love, Honor, Cherish. There's no question it's about marriage. You might not know which side we're on, but it's about marriage. And it's about speaking, I think, to this higher truth. And we have got to, I think gay people, um, we, we spend, uh, even today, uh, time use, using euphemisms to describe our relationships, to dis we're, we're careful about what pronouns we use with strangers. Uh, my roommate, my friend, my partner, um, I went with that person as opposed to him. Um, we, we don't always speak directly to what the real issues are. And I think that it is critical that we, as a movement, and it's something that Andre and I are both focused on doing, is speaking really clearly. Um, there is no threat to someone else's marriage from two gay people getting married. And you know, we talk about this so-called Defensive Marriage Act constantly. What in the world are they defending marriage from? Um, also, religion. Yes, we respect religious values and principles, but absolutely no religion should discriminate against gay couples. And yet we, we are reluctant to ever say these things. Um, and so one of the, the, I think, lessons from having uh, had these discussions during the Prop 8 campaign and uh, you know, really lived those decisions is just, I think, to, to, at least to my mind, a greater uh, clarity that we must always just simply appeal to the higher truth and also, I think, be careful about always focusing on, on more sort of abstract terms. Um, equal rights, uh, yes, um, equal, equal rights in context of the lesbian and gay movement is, or LGBT movement is uh, a fantastic term to use. And certainly, as a lawyer, it's a very important term to use in the judicial process. Um, but with to ordinary people, equality and fairness doesn't necessarily mean recognizing my relationship or Andrea's relationship or the families that we create. Right on. <laughs> I just wanted to actually just highlight a couple other other, other things. Um, you know, one on this 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 issue of um, of you know speaking more truthfully. Um, let's go back, for instance, to the, to the school situation. Just recently, I think that many of you are, are hopefully aware, um, the, the governor had passed in July or signed into law uh, the Fair Education Act, which is fair, accurate, inclusive, and respectful education act. And it is an, its intent, and it is a bill that was sponsored, co-sponsored by Equality California and the GSA Network, uh, Gay, Gay Straight Alliance Network, and authored by Senator Mark Leno. And the intent is to start including in public instruction LGBT civil rights history. And 
this is not the first time that there's been an attempt um, to have that kind of, of um, uh, inclusive education um, in the California public schools, but it is now, it, it'll go into effect in, in January. So along with that, there was certainly pushback from opponents. They tried to mount a referendum um, campaign um, in the June primary of 2012. That failed. We were able to hold them back. Now they're going to try again for November. So we'll, we'll, we'll be ready to do battle with them. But this issue of teaching, and I think that we're, uh, for instance, in truth-telling, that as we move forward, um, that we continue to grapple with is, see, when the other folks talk about teaching, they're not really talking about teaching. They're talking about recruiting. <laughs> and so when we frame it as if they're actually talking about teaching, uh, it's, it's, it's a, it's a very, very, um, uh, it's a, it's a particularly unique challenge. What they're concerned about, or what they would like people to be concerned about, is that here's an agenda, this is the gay agenda, the, through marriage equality, they're gonna get into our schools and they're gonna recruit, you know, little Johnny or little Susie into becoming gay, and that's how you become gay. You get recruited in the second grade, and God help us all, we can't let that happen. Um, so I think that we have to be even more definitive at moving forward and helping to expose or deconstruct for people. Now, that, let's be really direct and really clear about what's happening here. Um, the other piece is, again, back to this issue of, um, of, of um, speaking to the, the, um, the higher truth around um, religion is that to be even be more clear, and maybe we can, we can sort of talk about this a bit more, why that is, is really important. After the passage of Prop A, the media hype and, and so on, uh, as many of you re recall, was, was the fact that 70% of African Americans had voted yes on Prop 8, therefore the 70% of African Americans delivered the victory on Prop 8. Thank God for the African Americans. We now don't have gay marriage. Well, um, and I don't want to sound any in any way, shape, or form defensive about that because I happen to be African American. But um, from as, ob as objective uh, a stance as possible, one, we knew that not to be true, that in the end African Americans did not vote at a 70% rate. They voted no more disproportionate or radically disproportionate to other racialized groups uh, around Prop 8. But race was being, again, sort of pivoted um, as a, you know, a wedge issue and gays can't get along with black folks and gays can't get along with other people of color and so on and, and, and as if there are no gay people of color. Um, and so some really tricky and funky stuff in that regard. But what it led folks even within our movement to believe was that the number one or one of the top issues or correlations between how someone voted on that particular proposition or how they felt about marriage equality was the issue of race, when in fact it wasn't. So faith or one's religious beliefs um, continue to be the number one issue. The second piece to that, um, beyond, the, the, the beyond religion as the number one issue, so I think it was religion, um, your, um, your political affiliation, Democrat, Republican, Independent, um, age, where you were in the state, um, and then race came, I think, another point after that. So it wasn't even in the top five. But also how um, speaking the, 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 the truth to the harm done by you know, the damage or the, the impact and the suffering, and I think that that's what we want to get into a bit now, 
is also very important moving forward. I think that there's still some fuzziness for folks in terms of they see the hurt and the pain and the trauma um, sort of on a broader level of, of, having, of being the only group, the only group in United States history and Jenny will correct me, or, or Cleve or someone and, and, or will correct me. Are we not the only group in United States history where a civil right was actually taken away, okay? Was actually taken away at the ballot box, actually taken away. Jenny's sort of doing this, maybe. Come saw, we'll come see, come saw. But nonetheless, um, we are, if we're not the only one, we're the, one of the few in modern history uh, where that has occurred. Um, and so understanding and, and really helping people understand the impact of this is important. That's why it's also important to be truthful that teaching LGBT civil rights history in schools is important because it's about truth telling. <laughs> and so there's, there's a, you know, a, a interface between what's happening on, on, for instance, the Fair Education Act and what is happening in the movement around marriage equality. So as Tom says, to deny that um, has repercussions and consequences that may not serve us well. I think focusing in on the kind of Prop 8 loss, I think that the trauma suffered by LGBT people as well as the leaders of our organizations from that loss is one that we really can't, I think, underestimate uh, now looking back in, back three years on it. Um, as Andrea talked about, we know kind of the groups that we need to target and kind of some of the issues um, as to why folks voted against us, but on a macro level, the main reason they voted against us is because they weren't gay. And it was the majority of the people of California. Now, it was a slim majority. Um, that realization that in our safe golden state and San Francisco and LA, that the majority of voters don't like us, essentially, is one that I think was really devastating. And it was particularly devastating juxtaposed with a nation that had made a quantum leap forward in terms of equality by electing Barack Obama. And I, and I think that as part of our efforts to rationalize and compartmentalize ourselves to protect ourselves was one of the reasons folks did reach out and kind of blame um, you know, people of color or blame Mormons uh, when it really was the majority of people and essentially non-gay people um, for the most part. Um, Jenny talked about, I think uh, Jenny Pizer talked about the point that life is not eternal. Um, our love and our families um, are things that exist now, and they may not exist in the same, w same way in two years or five years or whenever it is that we next um, can marry within California. Uh, while we wait on the courts, our loved ones die, or we won't be able to have a family member at our wedding. Critically, our youth have to wait for it to get better. Um, it is getting better thanks to Glee and Modern Family and, and just society in general, but unfortunately teenage suicide is still common. We have the, I think, uh, one of the most significant and probably leading edge places in the world uh, to live in and to create change in, and yet we have not managed um, in three years to really make significant progress. Um, I think we also, I mean, one of the, the um, issues that Apsara touched upon in, in uh, the introduction is Love on Our Cherish, the group that um, I, I lead, is, um, has repeatedly been advocating um, for us to seek repeal at the ballot, uh, to act affirmatively. And one of the issues that we have is folks fear losing um, again at the ballot because the trauma was so great um, during Prop 8 and in November of 2008. We don't want another day as bad as the day we lost Prop 8. The morning that we woke up, as a friend of mine said, I had to explain to my children what had happened and that they lived in a place where their parents weren't respected. Um, I understand that. But to get by, I think we pay an enormous cost by ignoring the day-to-day -day inhumanity that we experience by being less than equal. Which I think leads us into 
um, the, uh, the kind of action phase of where we are today. Uh, we are, um, I, I agree with uh, the sen sentiment expressed earlier that indeed we are confident uh, in ultimate success. Um, unlike others, I do not have infinite patience. Um, I have been remarkably doing this for 20 years. I never thought it would take that long for folks to recognize our basic humanity. And therefore, I feel a lot of urgency about this. And um, Prop 8 indeed was an epic loss, but the question is what are we going to do about it? With that, maybe I'll turn it over to Andrea. <laughs> Well, there clearly is no, no singular thing to do. There are many things that we can be doing better, but there are a few things that we can, we can really uh, at least acknowledge that are going to be just absolutely essential um, guidepost as, as we move forward. Um, one of the things sort of, again, we're, 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 we're offering as best as possible a sort of a different kind of political analysis. One thing that I think is, is also important to, to share, there's, there's, there's two things, uh, rather two things. One is when we're speaking of, of our own truths, is who people understand the LGBT community to be. And in the state of California, um, with all due respect to other states, um, you know, whether it's Oregon, Maine, Vermont, et cetera. Uh, California has a particularly unique and powerful um, role in terms of defining who the LGBT community is. And what I mean by that is this. I think the rough and tumble of it is that the perception of the LGBT community is still people want to believe that it is about gay white men, that that is the face or the perception of that's sort of the legitimate, that, that's legitimately gay. Anything else is kind of maybe tinkering around with being gay, but not really legitimate. Now, I actually live in the Castro. <laughs> I've lived there for my nearly 20 years that I've been here on my, on my anniversary date to date. Um, I know it to be a, a, a more diverse community than I think people would expect it to be, but I'm also very well aware of the fact that, that uh, it has some um, room to grow in terms of diversity. I also know that as significant and as historical a place it is in terms of our movement, it ain't the only place where things are happening. Um, but in California, the, the idea or the perception or if we continue as a movement to not sort of reckon with that in a more positive way. I know we talk about diversity. Um, some may say, wow, she, she's, you know, she's African American herself. She's played a leadership role in our movement. Um, how could this be an issue? Well, it's not about me. And it's not about any singular person. It's about who we are as Californians. The reality is this, it's simple math. When we're talking about moving forward and doing the kind of necessary coalition work that needs to occur, it's not coalition work that is just about can't we all just get along right now so that I can get married and you can go home and then we're all happy. It's about how we come to understand and define ourselves as a community and part of the broader progressive movement. In California, we have a majority minority population. So the majority of folks that live in the state of California are in fact people of color. So simple mathematical deduction would suggest that the majority of LGBT identified Californians then are likely to be people of color. So if that is a majority experience, as a movement, there are, uh, we, we must make sure <laughs> that we are um, equipped or getting better equipped um, to really harness that, that diversity of energy within our own community. 
because very much the perception is that when we're talking about LGBT politics, on externally, it's really about the, the rights um, and benefits of gay white folk. And so there's still work to be done, and that's ongoing work. So that's still ongoing work um, in the marriage fight as well, because otherwise it has no relevancy for other folks. Um, the other piece is actually the, is continuing to, to, to certainly do the coalition work that's necessary in order to move uh, forward on marriage equality, but also it's gotta be something bigger than marriage equality. It has to be, again, how do we engage um, as, a, as a movement in the sort of larger uh, platform of progressive movement where the, our issues are central and core to the progressive movement as are the issues of labor, as are the issues of environmental justice, as are the issues of economic security, et cetera, et cetera, where we are not incidental. And I think that to some extent that there was something of a wake up and a shock that was positive post the passage of Proposition 8, where not only were we angry and upset as queer people, but who else was angry and upset were people saying, wait a minute, I'm on your side, I'm at your table, and I want a place at the table to help this, help this move forward. Include us. We're part of the team. We're part of the package. You can't do this alone. And so I think that as we move forward, um, really recognizing the kind of coalitional politics, the kind of coalitional uh, building and energy that it, will, that it continues to take in the state of California, in particular, given our unique demographic, is not something that's incidental. It's not something that's a luxury or just sort of sounds good and maybe we'll get around to it and wouldn't it be nice if one day we could all get along. It's about much more than that. And so I think that whatever we do moving forward to secure or restore marriage equality in, Cal in California, that that particular uh, approach is going to be, uh, will, will remain key. So that's one thing. Appreciate coalition politics. So I, I think that um, the, the question that at least folks like Andre and I spend a lot of time talking about and thinking about because it's getting close to the time to act is whether or not we should um, seek repeal in November 2012. Obviously the court case, the Perry case is a huge issue. Um, yesterday was a setback. I mean, I think that a number of us hoped that there would be a procedural way to win marriage back in California that would not require the U.S. Supreme Court to ultimately make a ruling on the merits. That became much less likely yesterday. Uh, the time frame for uh, the Ninth Circuit to rule and the U.S. Supreme Court to rule uh, is uh, relatively broad. It could be very soon or it could take a couple years and, and the legal folks will uh, I'm sure correct me or, or add further insight to that um, during the question period. But at least from my perspective, uh, we do not have a uh, strong likelihood of prevailing at the U.S. Supreme Court. And an adverse Supreme Court ruling would be devastating to getting equality in all of the small uh, towns and uh, places around the country that are not as LGBT friendly. We could, however, uh, achieve equality in California um, with a new initiative. And I think that um, you know, that would be November 2012. It would probably be the most important initiative in the history of the country were we to be successful. It would frame the debate, would motivate people, and organize us again. And I think also rehabilitate us from, I think, the trauma of, um, of Prop 8. Um, I think that. Uh, and, and this really is, I mean, whether it's the Milk movie or, or all of our history that we've talked about today, is all of the acts uh, from Harvey Milk on that have been the ones that have made us who we are are ones where we took a major risk. And certainly uh, going to the voters and asking for our rights 
is um, a major risk. It is not uh, going to be easy. Now, the polling does support uh, the likelihood of success in this case. I mean, we've made major progress in three years. Um, the question is whether or not we have the will and whether or not we're going to do it and whether or not we have the organization and, and lots of other you know, really serious questions. But that's, that's uh, the, today's state of the art, uh, the state of our, our political situation, is whether that makes sense whether we can do it, and whether we should. Um, I think the should is answered pretty easily um, from a, uh, I think, a, at least a theoretical perspective, which is, I think, any willingness to wait a single extra day for equality undermines the importance of the equality we're seeking sitting on our hands when we have a reasonable possibility of success and saying we'll wait for others to do it um, undermines the value of what we're fighting for. And I think it reflects uh, to our youth, um, I think we owe it to our youth to show them that we are willing to stand up and fight for what is right at every stage of the game. And I feel like we haven't been doing that for a couple years because of the post-Prop 8 trauma. Um, now, of course, there are enormous practical, pragmatic considerations, and um, I think Andrea will talk for a minute about those. Well, I think that it's, 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 it's uh, certainly, you know, some considerations, as you, as you said, are, are quite obvious. There are many things that one needs in order to, to mount and orchestrate and uh, win. Um, a, a successful initiative um, effort. But I think that one of the challenges always for our community, which pr I think becomes particularly salient in this particular case, is that issue of pragmatism. A number of folks have asked, have asked me over the last couple of years, said, you know, uh, you know we don't want to spend another 40 million something dollars going back to the ballot. That's a heck of a lot of money. And uh, we lost. Uh, and we, we don't, we have other uh, challenges in our community, it's a bad economy, et cetera, et cetera. And I say, I totally, you know, I understand that. I don't personally have $40 million, so I, I'm, I'm <laughs> very, very well aware that that would be a tremendous undertaking. Um, it, um, however, my question sometimes to, to folks is this, is that, uh, is, what is actually pragmatic? Um, what is the cost, or, or what is the what? What is it worth to folks to fight to have your civil rights restored? And that's not something that you know I personally can answer for someone, or personally answer for the movement in and of itself. But I think that in terms of the 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 the, I think part of the challenge here is to really dig a little deeper in terms of what is really practical and what is pragmatic. How long to wait? How long is too long? <laughs> How long is not so long? Um, what are the various ways, aside from uh, waiting for the courts, to, to secure or fight to secure um, equal rights, if it should be at the ballot, if there are other ways to do, should we just go with one singular track, these are sort of strategic questions. But I think that as a movement, we always at least have to be mindful in terms of, of what we understand or what we define to be uh, pragmatic and practical uh, against the weight of the need to restore um, a civil right in this particular instance, in this particular case, and what the implications are of, of doing that, of moving forward or not moving forward. So that sounds like a roundabout way <laughs> of, of saying that they're, you know, clearly acknowledging that there are serious concerns or questions with regard to what is next. Um, but I do think that it's, in, it's it very important that we at least step back and say, what is it worth to you? Who says it would cost $40 million anyway? But what is it really worth? Um, 
you know, in, in order to, to be a movement that works in a very active and proactive way to um, restore marriage equality in California. I think we're ready for questions. Okay. If that makes sense. Please ask us some questions. So while, while folks are coming up, I, <laughs> the, uh, I, I heard not that long ago a good analogy to what we're really trying to do here, which is essentially make ice cubes. You put the ice cube tray in, you fill it with, you fill it with water, put it in the freezer, you come back 15 minutes later, nothing has happened. Come back 30 minutes later, maybe a tiny little crystal, nothing's happened. 40, 50 minutes later, it looks exactly the same. You check three or four minutes later and the cube is solid. We have the ability to do that in California and the impact of that would be heard around the world. Okay. So at this point, we'd like to invite our other panelists back up to the stage. And then um, you can be thinking of any questions you'd like to ask our two panelists that are on the stage now or the entire group. Um, and then we'll have uh, a sort of plenary discussion amongst everyone. Um, I just have one question, um, perhaps for Andrea and Tom, but maybe for the entire group is, um, I think reaching new audiences is something that is really important um, uh, for everyone really involved in this. And I'm wondering what sort of strategies um, you have developed in your organizations in order to um, reach new communities and audiences and groups. Well, I actually, th yeah, there was another point that I, I had hoped to make coming back to the issue of, of the faith communities. Um, I wouldn't necessarily qualify faith communities as being new, um, uh, you know, groups to reach out to, but I think that there are some newer ways or better ways in which to engage people within the faith community t that we've certainly been working on or I've been in involved with. And it actually started prior to... Uh, my involvement at EQCA, that's really what I was doing through And Marriage for All, that particular project. And And Marriage for All was a public education um, project reaching out to really African American communities, African American leadership, and African American churches um, on the issue specifically of marriage equality. And so this was a campaign that was run simultaneous to the No on Eight um, effort and actually was very successful. I think that some of the, the in, in terms of, uh, I don't know that there are new communities um, so much in this state as just how do we continue to more effectively engage the diversity of communities that we have. Um, clearly, again, as I stressed before, working in coalition with or other organizations that may or may not be LGBT is just so vital. Uh, and in terms of how to have those inroads to the leaders of those communities, to you know the the little league coaches, to the folks that are that are um, really making those those communities thrive, and where they have their points of of um, discussion and how decisions get made. So ha having some understanding of how the cultural processes work is just so vital. You cannot underestimate that. So my response, uh, and again, I apologize if, if, if it sounds too general, but I don't know that there are new communities. I think it's how we continue to work better <laughs> at the existing diversity of communities in this particular state. If there's anything that's new, it would be somewhat generational. I think that navigating a lot of the techie stuff and you know, Cleve has been involved as a senior advisor at Courage Campaign. There's a whole generation of the whole Netroots um, world and how they're operating and moving about. We're all hooked up and wired up. 
I still don't know why, but I have two phones with me today, um, each of them with various capabilities. But nonetheless, if there's anything new, I think it's how we continue to get our message out through those kinds of technologies and, and so on. But ultimately, there are no new communities. It's just how we work better and develop stronger relationships with existing communities. Um, I, 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 would, I would add, though, that we have uh, identified through rather extensive polling specific groups of folks that are uh, perhaps riper fruit uh, in terms of converting. Um, for, for example, and we've been very successful, I believe, with uh, Latino women in California. Uh, there's been a tremendous surge in support for marriage equality. Uh, another group, uh, for, for example, that uh, has been targeted somewhat, but any new campaign would particularly target is, I believe, uh, white women over 50 who live along the coast and voted for Barack Obama. They're, they're obviously at least willing on one level to be you know, relatively liberal, and uh, they're most likely rather persuadable. And so there's been progress with that set of folks. Um, the, other, uh, the other thing, I, as just somebody who's out doing um, this work, there's tremendous support um, in large swaths of California uh, that we don't necessarily always go to or don't always uh, talk to the people at. I mean, the single strongest, uh, the, at least anecdotally, among uh, the folks in my organization, the strongest support for marriage equality um, are uh, straight couples with children in strollers who go to farmers markets. They are much more ardent than anyone in the LGBT community in terms of supporting our right to marry because they have recently been married, they understand how important it is, they understand how important it is for their child. So some of that work has been done. I think the bigger question is um, post Prop 8 we had the beginnings of a revolution and it died out because of lots of reasons, but one I think was a, a legitimate hope that the courts would do the right thing, first in California and then Perry, and do it in some relatively expeditious way. Um, also, we, we have you know, had a national crisis, you know, seems to be a different one every day, um, but how do we re-involve and re-enthuse our own community to get out and do the work? That, that seems to me to be a, a, in many ways, a harder question um, we know from the work mainly that Andre has done and folks in my group have done, we've had more than a million conversations, uh, probably closer to two million um, since Prop 8 passed. We have persuaded lots of people. The polls are, are significantly improved, and they're significantly improved, as I said, in certain communities uh, where we have done the work. So um, it is doable, and um, we, we have seen progress, and we, we have, I think, at least some sophistication as to how to do that. Um, so, uh, a couple of questions. Uh, do you have a question, for, uh, Suzanne, from online? Uh, Barton uh, asked a question earlier today. She wants to know uh, what will happen to those same-sex couples who are legally married in San Francisco by Gavin Newsom now that Prop 8 has eliminated future marriages. Uh, so, uh, what happens to the status of, of, uh, of uh, couples who were married uh, before uh, uh, the Prop 8 decision? The question is couples who were married um, in 2004 when Mayor Newsom opened that chapter where he in particular was the driver of, of that month of uh, winter of love. Those marriages were voided by the California Supreme Court and I think among the things that, was, um, that we all could see, a, a, an important lesson from that, um, was that couples who married, even knowing that there were some legal questions about whether the marriage would be valid, were very emotionally attached to the experience that they had gone through. It was very powerful for many people. Um, and then when the Supreme Court said, well, actually, the local government did not have the authority to do that, the marriages are not, are not valid, uh, people felt an enormous sense of injury and loss. Um, and then, we had a number of years of litigation and community activism and education, and then in 2008, things were opened again. And the couples that married in 2008 remain married because of the Supreme Court's interpretation of the relevant law. Um, I think that tells us a couple of different things, but most dramatically demonstrates that 
this interaction between a legal process, a political process, and the fact that this is about people's lives. And, and so the expressions of love and commitment done with an intention that there be a permanent change in relationship, in legal status, that that's very powerful for people independent of what the law is saying about it. I have a, um, a, a different question. It's more back on uh, the sort of political arena, which is that um, you know, in the in the last, uh, the, the, the old politics of the next twelve months may well uh, turn around um, economic issues and uh, issues of employment, and you know, we've seen uh, in the last couple of months a you know rather you know a startling um, refocusing on issues of economic inequality and something we hadn't seen f for a long time and what does that context mean for for this for, for our um, uh, progress around marriage equality how does that change the political um, environment for this Cleve well I think it requires us to ask of ourselves a, a question um, when you were speaking earlier, you know, you referred a number of times to being part of the larger progressive movement. You called us a progressive movement. You and I know each other well enough to know where, you know, what our politics are, and we, we come from the left. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not, at this point, convinced that the gay and lesbian political movement is a progressive movement. I base that, and I invite you to do this yourselves, but if you go home and Google the words U.S. progressive organizations, you can very quickly generate a long list of organizations working to fight racism, to expand access to health care, to defend the environment, to uh, uh, reproductive uh, choice rights, um, the whole gamut of, of issues that we identify as from the left, from the progressive movement. And I think historically it's a, a true statement that most, though not all, but most of our leaders came out of left-wing movements, particularly the civil rights, the historic civil rights movement, the feminist movement uh, was incredibly influential to, uh, to all of us in the beginning, and, and the anti-war movement. Now, if you do that Google search and you generate that list of progressive organizations fighting the good fight on all these fronts, and you go to their websites, you're going to see something very different when you go to the gay and lesbian organizations websites. What you're going to see is corporate branding. In this city in the last election, I'm not going to name names or get into the, to the, 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 the details that created the conflict, but there was a mailer that went out under the name of a national gay organization that, in my view, was financed by Pacific Gas and Electric who is their, that particular organization's third largest corporate donor, and that company has representatives on their board. Uh, my, one of my closest friends happens to live in San Bruno, <laughs> so I have some very strong feelings about Pacific Gas and Electric. And those of you who might be watching this on the net or are not familiar with our local situation here, uh, Pacific Gas and Electric blew up a neighborhood in San Bruno last year. Um, you look at the websites of the national organizations and you see corporate branding for Wells Fargo, Bank of America, Goldman Sachs, British Petroleum. Uh, I work for the hotel workers. It's enormously frustrating to me to look at the, the Human Rights Campaign um, Equality Index giving 100% to British Petroleum, Hyatt Hotels, and Goldman Sachs. So apparently at the Human Rights Campaign, we're not concerned about the devastation of the Gulf of Mexico, the exploitation of immigrant women labor in the Hyatt Hotels, or Goldman Sachs' role in kicking the economy off the precipice. So I certainly think it's appropriate for social service providers to take the corporate money. I say take as much as you can get. I think it's, it, it's totally appropriate for cultural organizations. If uh, Wells Fargo is going to uh, support this incredible institution, I don't know that they do, I suspect they do since they give money to almost everybody, uh, then they should be uh, giving money to Paul, and I think they, they do. Um, so I got no problem with that. But for political advocacy groups, I have a huge problem with it. And I think that's why, to my knowledge, there, and I've looked, so correct me if I'm wrong, but I have not seen a single statement from any of the national gay and lesbian organizations about the Occupy movement. 
I don't think we're going to see it. Now, when we take that money, you, it, 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 it always comes with strings. The strings may not be readily visible. They may not be felt for some time. But we had a really bad experience this year uh, where uh, one of our organizations was very badly damaged because they got instructions from one of their corporate sponsors to send a letter. And they did it. I believe another one did as well. It didn't get as much flack, didn't cost her her job. But uh, there were editorials in the Boston Globe and the New York Times about this conflict. So I think that's something we really have to look at. And I think this is even almost more important than the perception of us as, as all white men, is uh, this perception that uh, we're really kind of self-absorbed and only interested in this one thing. Now, I care very much about the marriage equality, and I want it to move forward, and you know you and I disagree strategically on, on where we're going now, but I also think that it's important for you to not say any of us, not just, I'm not just singling you out. This is a, a mistake I've made as well. Uh, repealing Prop 8 does not bring marriage equality to California. Uh, we will still remain second class citizens, as we do in New York and Iowa and everywhere else. And we will remain so until the Defense of Marriage Act is overturned and there's federal action that can give us our rights in all 50 states. I don't think that's going to come through a long state by state. Uh, series of campaigns. I think it, it has to come from the feds. But I just, in California, same-sex couples have the rights that the state's capable of granting them. And um, so I just, you know, as we ponder all of the different possibilities for 2012, that should be an issue. But I'm much more concerned about the bigger picture right now. I think this is a pivotal moment in our history. I'm dismayed that our organizations have not taken a stand and, uh, and I'm not a single issue person. Uh, I'm really not. I, I want it all. I want it all. I want justice for everybody. And I really want to be part of that big coalition. And you know, we did a, a, a pretty poor job of it in that last campaign. But it's not just that campaign. We've done a. a we have a proud history, and I think we've kind of turned our back on it. So I'm sorry, that went on and on, but well, I let think me, that's let me a respond big, big if I may. question. Um, I mean, I, I think that we have essentially all of the legal rights that the state can grant. Unfortunately, I mean, and this is something where I know Jenny Pizer has done far more thinking about and work on than I have. Domestic partnership is simply not the same as marriage. Um, and that is really important. Um, the Defense of Marriage Act is uh, obviously a huge blight on our country. But I think the question uh, that those in the room and probably at least many of the folks watching uh, on the web who live in California, the question is what can we do as Californians? Uh, we have Senator Feinstein. We have a very progressive set of congressional leaders that are on the right side of getting rid of the Defense of Marriage Act. And how, um, how exactly are we going to accomplish doing that? It's not going to happen while we have a Republican-led Congress, most likely. Um, so the, the question for me is, what do we do? And are we a people of focus on addressing the problems we can address and, and solving them, or are we going to be scattershot among uh, lots of different issues? Obviously, social justice uh, is one. DOMA is one. Uh, marriage rights in the states are one. We still don't have ENDA passed. Um, so I think there's a, uh, a series of things, each of which I've spent you know, a significant amount of my life focusing on. But I think as a community, we should choose our fights and get success. And I think Don't Ask, Don't Tell was an example. Ultimately, we kind of came together and managed to do that, but it took 20 years. Um, we need uh, to pick our battles, and those of us in California, I think, can be most effect effective by uh, getting marriage in the largest state in the union. We're, uh, uh, Jenny, could you grab the microphone? Please, yeah. And we're approaching the end of our time, but we should take another couple of thoughts about this. 
Yeah, so I, I mean, I um, think, well, we could, we could talk all afternoon, but I, I want to make maybe two, two points. One is, I think the full range of issues matters. And, um, and I do think one thing that the, the legal advocacy has done, at least as, as done by uh, some of the community, com community based nonprofits, has been, and I think you see this if you look at the websites, um, uh, is to work across a range of essential issues. I mean, healthcare is critical, employment is critical, physical safety, proper treatment by government. Uh, family equality, of course, is central. I mean, a, a thing that defines us as queer people is how we create family, and marriage equality is part of it, but it's certainly not the only part of it. All of those things are incredibly important, and we live in communities, and so the things that make for strong, healthy communities are just as important to queer people as they are to anybody. All of those things matter, and I do think they relate to each other. Um, so... Um, and, and, I, and I think it's incredibly important that we achieve successes. So Tom and I sometimes disagree about um, the way to proceed. I mean, I think that, I think that winning step to step to step um, builds momentum and builds a sense of, um, of strength and confidence. And um, each of us brings our own judgment about what risks to take, which things will succeed. You know, as far as I'm concerned, if we're all doing things, and making judgments in good faith using the best intelligence we have, then, that, I mean, that's part of why this movement has continued to advance, and having different views is a healthy thing. I mean, I actually think having lots of different views and being uh, free to exchange them is, is essential for the movement to be vibrant. Um, my, uh, so a thought I want to add in terms of this coming year in response to that particular question, because I think economic issues ne necessarily are going to dominate um, the next year of political work. Here in California, it seems, I think, likely that there will be a ballot fight about SB 48, the Fair Education Act that uh, Andrea mentioned. If I mean, history has taught that uh, sometimes efforts by the groups that oppose LGBT equality don't succeed until we're in the cycle be before a major election and then suddenly money materializes to pay signature gatherers and a measure gets on the ballot. That's exactly what happened with, with Prop 8. I do fear that it may happen again. And something we should note, I think, is the convergence between discussions of marriage equality or family equality for same-sex couples and issues about school um, I mean, it was school and kids that were used misleadingly um, to, to drive Prop 8 forward and to take away marriage equality. Uh, here, you know, here we are again. I mean, it certainly could be possible. I personally don't know where the money comes from to put a repeal measure on the ballot. But if we were to en envision such a thing, if it were to be on the ballot, it would be probably much the same conversation um, to, to repeal Prop 8 and to protect SB 48. Because the point is that LGBT people are fine, and that um, that this actually should shift, I think, a little bit. I mean, a missing piece that we haven't talked about for a long time. We've talked about same-sex couples. We've talked about lesbians and gay men. We haven't talked that much about bisexual people. And as a litigator, you know, I'll just say, well, part of the point is that courts are already confused enough. And part of the argument has been, look, we're gay, we can't help it, and so you know, treat us equally because you know, we are just who we are. Well, there's this idea in the middle of that, I think, embedded, and it, it may be that there has to be more discussion about it if we're going to have schools be what they should be, that it is fine for a bisexual person who has the capacity to love a person of this sex or of this sex to choose whatever is the best person for that person to love. And the idea that if, well, if you have a cap the capacity to have a meaningful different sex relationship, you should do that. And you should, you know, we'll, we'll give you rights if you really can't help yourself and you're just gay and that's all you can do. Well, the, the core of that is getting to a society where it really is okay to, to be whoever you are. And that's, that idea is what reduces bullying and that's why we need to have curriculum that includes the contributions of everybody so that kids and adults and everybody can see the diversity of people that we've had through our history. And, and so that's a harder conversation, but I think that's the chapter that we're now in. 
and it's not going to dominate the national election, but I think it has to be part of what happens in California, and it will be, I think, the next step in the sort of anti-bullying, it gets better. I mean, we will be making it better if we include more centrally the idea that whoever you are, that's just fine. Did you want to add well, something? Yeah. If I might just address uh, very briefly that I think also there are some very tangible ways that our struggles intersect. Um, and we know, for example, that lesbian and gay couples and their children um, who are close to the poverty line are among those who are affected most by inequality with respect to marriage. Uh, they're the ones who need most some of the critical federal safety nets that come along with uh, respect for their marriages. And so as a former legal services and legal aid attorney, uh, it, for those who care about trying to aid low-income communities, I think sometimes the struggle against discrimination in all forms, not just discrimination with respect to sexual orientation or gender identity, is sometimes most meaningful to those who live at the margins who are struggling the most. Um, and you know, these are folks who are struggling so hard that they often don't have a chance to be part of a movement on the streets um, because they have family obligations, they're taking care of sick parents and so on. Um, but they are the people who often uh, benefit the most. Something else that we find when we struggle for equality in marriage is that other beautiful things happen along the way. And when we filed our lawsuit in Iowa, for example, there was no non-discrimination law that prevented discrimination in employment, public accommodations, housing, with respect to sexual orientation, let alone gender identity. There was no law that prevented bullying specifically with respect to sexual orientation for children in school. Um, and there were a number of other protections that simply didn't exist for the community. But that happened along the way because when you ask for everything, then the other things that people believe are threatening seem to, to become less of a threat. Um, so, you know, we can't necessarily devote all of our time to every struggle, but I think sometimes um, it, if we are respectful and if we are endeavoring to make a difference with respect to discrimination in one community, we often find that there are beautiful opportunities to form a coalition along the way. Well, we, uh, we've really approached the end of our time, and I uh, would, uh, on behalf of the museum, really want to very much thank all of you for being here. And it's in the context of this exhibition, which is so much the credit to the credit, 100% to the credit of <laughs> Apsara to, to have, uh, have uh, staged in this institution. And, and um, you know, such a wonderful thing for the rest of us to have been involved in, in, in working on. It's been um, just, uh, it, it feels incredibly important that we've had the opportunity to have you uh, have, this, have this discussion, get this discussion on the record so it can stand alongside uh, the book and the exhibition as, as some sort of um, participation in this ongoing movement that this, this museum was able to make at this point. But uh, uh, we're going to you know, retreat upstairs and have a glass of wine um, and uh, continue talking up there. But for the moment, um, thank you all very much. <laughs>